So far in our unit, we've been having a look at food equity, the causes of food equity, who experiences food inequity, and we've also had a look at food availability and distribution. This unit today is having a look at malnutrition, which is a result of food inequity. Let's just recall some definitions uh, from the last unit of work. So we've got undernutrition, which occurs when there isn't enough nutrients taken in, and overnutrition is when people consume too much of at least one nutrient, like fat or carbohydrates. So just have a look at these two pictures and have a think about what you would consider would be a person with malnutrition. Would it be the person on the left who clearly doesn't have enough to eat or the person on the right who clearly has had plenty to eat? I think typically we would think that it is the person on the left, but actually malnutrition occurs with you having too much or not enough food. So our definition for malnutrition, which you should record in your glossary, is ill health caused by an imbalance in food intake that results in the body not receiving an adequate supply of nutrients. So it can occur from not eating enough food or not eating the right food or the wrong combination of foods or just eating too much of the wrong food. So it's not just related to not enough food, but not enough protein, energy, um, the micronutrients, so vitamins and minerals, can also relate to infections, disease, inadequate health and unsafe water and sanitation. When people are malnourished, it can actually affect a lot of things. It's their growth, physical health, mood, behaviour and the bodily functions. So people can actually eat diets which are high in kilojoules, but aren't very um, high in vitamins and minerals. So that can mean that they can actually become malnourished, even though they're getting quite big and they're consuming a lot of food. So just have a look at this picture here. Um, in the centre, it's telling us that 165 million children are suffering from malnutrition, which is actually enough to form a ring around the earth. So that's a bit quite scary if you thought about that. Um, a lot of children are malnourished because they don't have enough iron and iodine and that actually stops the brain developing properly. So that's four in 10 children in those developing countries. So you can imagine when their brain's not developing that they're actually then not able to read and write effectively, um, which then affects their health and also their ability to have jobs and things in later life. So just pause for a minute and have a look at this mind map which talks about what malnutrition can lead to. We've got um, some things that we've heard of, like we've got anorexia and bulimia which we looked at in the last unit, along with osteoporosis, um, anemia, but then these other things that we don't really hear of a lot of now, which is scurvy, goiter, pellagra, rickets, um, beriberi, they're very much diseases in these developing countries that still exist. You might want to make a note of those and draw a quick little mind map for yourself. So here's a couple of pictures just to show us what the effects of these diseases are. So we've got scurvy first. Um, we know about scurvy, um, a lot of people on the first fleet actually suffered from scurvy and it's because you're not getting enough fruit and vegetables, in particular vitamin C. So people started to lose their teeth, they've got very pale skin and their eyes are very sunken. Um, if you look on the right, we've got rickets, which we've talked about before, and rickets is a result of not having enough calcium. So you can see that they've got the bowed leg, lumpy joints, um, and all in general at like the bones not developing. Uh, the picture on the bottom is of a person with goiter, which occurs due to an iodine deficiency, and that is actually um, still quite common in developed countries. And then pellagra, which is also a disease we don't hear about a lot here in Australia, um, actually is involved with diarrhoea, dermatitis, dementia, and even death. A big problem in developing countries is that children are actually stunted. They've got stunted growth because they don't get enough nutrition um, when they're growing in their mum's tummies and also once they come out and they're being either breastfed or formula fed. Um, so if you have a look at the picture there, um, it's quite alarming when you have a look um, through Africa, you'll see that there's a big proportion of under five children who have stunted growth. Um, in Australia here, no available data. Actually, in most of the Western countries, there's no available data. So malnutrition actually affects a lot of children across the world. So half of all the deaths under five are due to not getting enough food. 
3 million children die every year and I think that's quite a, a huge amount. Um, not only are we getting deaths but it's putting children at greater risk of infection um, and that infection is often then leading to death but um, actually when they're infected they are quite sick during their time of life. I've just taken this clipping from Save the Children Fund and you'll see on the left hand side top 10 places um, that it's best to be a mother in the world and on the right hand side the bottom 10 so the worst places to be a mother in the world. So you have a look there we're actually ranked 7th um, so it's a pretty good to be a mother in Australia but it's all of those developed and richer countries Norway, Iceland, Sweden, New Zealand, Denmark so it's actually quite good for um, people to be mothers here whereas if you look um, on the right hand side that's a lot of um, African countries there and you've got Afghanistan as well. So when we have a look at the cost of malnutrition it relates to the cost not only the body of the individual which gets sick and then you have possible death but it also affects society so when you have a look at the cost and you think of the cost on society it's actually relating to economic and social burdens on the family who are providing health care and support. So the physical costs um, they can have obesity and heart disease, undernutrition can cause infertility, depression, osteoporosis, um, undernourished pregnant women then have the risk of having premature babies or as we saw before a lot of um, children with stunted growth. As I said social costs relate a lot back to the economics so um, you imagine people who are quite unwell they are unable to work and not only that but they also then have to be cared for by someone and um, especially in Australia then they are in receipt of payments from the government like disability pensions and things like that so malnutrition not only affects people physically but it also affects our society um, as we have more people who are being hospitalized or in nursing homes who've got higher rates of premature delivery and if we look at the other side of malnutrition which is people overeating we also have the increased risk of heart disease and diabetes which puts a big burden on our healthcare system. If we have a look at how they assess malnutrition it's actually by taking body measurements so they'll have a look at weight and height but they'll also take the circumference of the upper arm and you can see that in the picture on the right hand side and um, they'll also look for any fluid retention or swelling in the lower legs or feet so that information is taken from UNICEF. I want you to just pause and read through these signs and symptoms of malnutrition and make a note of some of them um, in your books and I think it's good to have a think about people who you know who might have some of these symptoms and have a think about whether you think they actually are malnourished. While we're very lucky here in Australia to have access to plenty of food and good health care, we actually have a whole range of older people who are malnourished and often they can be people who are in hospitals or aged care homes. We only have to have a look at the food that's dished out in some hospitals or nursing homes to see that the nutrition level isn't the highest. Um, don't forget when we've talked about before that older people have a reduced appetite, they're often not very motivated to cook because there's only one person at home. Um, a lot of them have poor mobility so they can't shop, it's hard for them to stand around and cook and other people, um, particularly older people who have illnesses might have difficulty swallowing or chewing. So we do have a big uh, problem with malnourishment amongst older people here in Australia. So in Australia the way that they assess malnutrition is by looking at the body mass index and we had a look at that a couple of months ago where you're looking at your weight in kilos divided by your height in meters squared and for most adults a healthy BMI is between 18 and a half and 24.9. I think this is slightly um, incorrect but um, that's what doctors will go by. Over the next few days I want you to have a think about if you know anyone who has any signs of malnutrition and how can you help them. Also have a think about any older people you know and have a look at those signs of malnutrition and have a think about um, how not getting enough food has affected them. The other thing I want you to have a think about is what it would be like to be a mother in a developing country. Uh, as I said we're very lucky here in Australia but a lot of people in developing countries don't have um, as good a healthcare system and they definitely don't have the access to food that we have. And what do you think that we could do to ensure that uh, we're not becoming part of these statistics of malnourishment.
So make sure that you've got some notes written on malnutrition and we'll talk further about this in class next week.